All right. Moderating the panel will be Charlie Fay. Did I, did I butcher that name too? No? Good. All right. And next we have Camila, and then Federico, Susanna, and Fig. Welcome. Welcome. Okay, cool. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel on IBC. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about um, what IBC is, but mo most importantly, what it can actually enable for the interchain ecosystem. So first, um, I'd just like to ask all of you to introduce yourself. You can. Hi, I'm Federico. I'm one of the co-founders of Edmos. Um, I started my career on Co in Cosmos in 2018. Um, where I started working on the SDK, then I transitioned to the team that shipped IVC in early uh, 2021, and then I moved to uh, Evmos. I'm Susanna. I'm currently working as the <laughs> product <laughs> lead. Um, the <laughs> what happened? Um, yeah, the, the product lead for the IVC team at Interchain. Um, before that, I was first introduced to the Cosmos ecosystem um, when I was working at Zero Knowledge Validator. Um, and before that, I did a PhD in biomanufacturing. Um, so, yeah. Hey guys, I'm, co I'm Fig, co founder of Squid. Uh, Squid is building on Axela. Um, we're building a cross chain swap and liquidity routing protocol, which is connecting EVM. EVM chains and other, uh, other chains that acts like connects into the IBC ecosystem. Hey everybody, my name is Camila Ramos. I lead developer relations over at Fuel Labs. And I'm gonna have a very different perspective than a lot of the amazing people on this panel because I'm relatively newer to the Cosmos space. I come from the Ethereum ecosystem and only in this year have I started getting into the Cosmos world. So I'm excited to bring all the questions. You know, have you guys seen that meme where it's like every team needs at least one dumb person to make sure the team is actually like knowing what they're doing? The, party, the puppy shooter. Yeah, that's me at this panel. <laughs> Now, I think it's a really exciting thing that we have both, um, you know, the old guard and the new guard. So it's great. Um, yeah, so the first question um, that I have is really about the expansion of use cases in IBC. Um, because as we all know, IBC has been the core of interoperability in the Cosmos ecosystem um, since its launch. And it has been one of the core value propositions of this kind of architecture. And the idea of interoperability as something more than token passing or something that can be highly secure with this native light client security is something that's really only starting to trickle into other ecosystems outside of Cosmos. Um, so I think what's really interesting is that we can look at how IBC is developing in Cosmos to get an idea of what developments might actually happen you know, across interoperability, but it also even in other ecosystems as, as time goes on. It's kind of like a precursor. So with that in mind, I just want to ask, um, starting with you, Susanna, what kind of use cases do you see happening in IBC uh, uh, as an expansion of token, of token passing? Yeah, so I think as Charlie mentioned, like IBC launched with token transfer as the original use case. And I think something really exciting that we can look forward to is token transfer with an instruction on something to do when you reach the destination. And this is harnessing the power of token transfer and interchain accounts. And I think this is really exciting because from a user perspective, you can do things like send your, your Osmo from Osmosis to Juno and immediately swap it for Juno when it reaches Juno. Um, or you could do something like move your atom from the hub to osmosis and immediately deposit it into a liquidity pool. Um, so it's just really expanding the functionality of token transfer, which is the main thing that IBC is used for right now. So I think that's the most exciting use case to look forward to for me. Um, yeah, and Federico, I guess. Yeah, um, I think like initially like we created the protocol so that we have the base layer which is the core IVC or IVC tau and on top of that we have applications. The first of them was IVC transfer. And now that Osmosis 
kind of like they're the go to market for IVC transfers, being like the first interchain DEX. But now we're starting to see like new applications that are creating um, new IVC apps, like for example, um, liquid staking is relying on uh, interchain accounts and interchain queries. Uh, and for example, Evmos, we're using an IVC middleware to like automatically convert those tokens uh, to ERC20s upon receiving them, or creating like, for example, new IVC precompiles so that we can expand IVC to um, not only chains, but now decentralized applications. Cool. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with both of those. Um, I guess the reality is that building cross-chain is like really hard, interacting with a bunch of different validator sets and even different virtual machines or ways of executing transactions. And yeah, we need to start with the simplest of, of things, which was token transfers, and now we've got swaps. And then, yeah, building up these primitives so that we might even, you know, one day reach a point where we can build applications. Uh, you don't even think about hitting different chains. You just you're um, you're accessing functionalities in different applications, which is the you know the Cosmos vision from the beginning. But um, we've got to get there slowly. So uh, just taking it step by step. What am I most looking forward to about IBC? There's nothing that. I, they have said that I can speak to. So <laughs> I'm excited to see all of this get developed. Um, one thing that's like maybe an interesting parallel that I can speak to is that, so at Fuel Labs, we're building Fuel, which is a modular execution layer. And one of the kind of thesis of what we're talking about is for modular blockchains that share a data availability layer, you can do trust minimized bridging. And for me as developer relations at Fuel, I've been thinking about kind of like what are the different trade-offs between using something like IBC in terms of trust assumptions versus using the trust assumptions that come with sharing a DA layer. So for me, that's something that I'm interested to learn more about, especially as like this stuff that you guys just talked about develops more. So protocol developers who are building modular blockchains can have these options and know the differences in kind of like the security guarantees and trust assumptions that come with them. Wait, um, I think we forgot the most important one that we've been talking about in the past day, which is interchain security, uh, of course. Uh, the main of them like being the hub, but also I'm excited to see how new um, applications in the space, app chains also transition into taking more like a hub position using interchain security. Yeah, I guess like one way to think about um, to think about different uh, IBC features like interchain accounts is is rather than having all of these apps in being I mean of course they're sovereign but rather than also uh, being siloed and sovereign they can be much more interoperable and kind of offer their services in a very bi-directional way I mean you know interchain security right now is one of those ways mesh security will be one of those ways and obviously as as you guys have discussed these other use cases will be there as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, given that now we have this understanding of IBC as something much more than a token bridge or something, you know, much more than kind of hand-holding your tokens across these different zones, um, I'm interested to hear about your experiences onboarding people onto this topic because I think it is a very different way of thinking about bridging or interoperability than is, is generally being thought about right now in, in other ecosystems. So um, yeah, starting, I guess, with your experience in the EVM. Um, in our experience, it has been better um, onboarding users directly from the Ethereum world into IVC, um, especially with our airdrop, um, because a lot of them were used to 15 second block times on Ethereum, uh, plus the confirmation time, um, whereas on, on Cosmos, you have the transactions that are involving the um, transfer itself and then receiving the acknowledgement on the sending chain. And so it can be at most like 30 seconds, which is like a huge improvement from like what users are traditionally um, using on other networks. So I think like has been a positive experience. And if you have, if you have chains that have like lower block times, like for example, Atmos, we have like two second block times, it, it can actually be even faster um, for chains connecting to through those. Um, well, I, I think like onboarding into the IBC ecosystem could be kind of taken as the bigger question of like, is IBC going to move beyond Cosmos blockchains? 
And um, I, I guess when IBC launched, it was originally just intended for the first kind of use case of these Cosmos chains. So using the Tendermint like client. And um, I think we've already seen a lot of interest from other ecosystems to plug into the IBC ecosystem. Um, I mean, maybe the first ecosystem is going to be Polkadot with Parachains and the work that um, Composable are doing. And uh, actually, at Inchchain, we recognize that there is a need to move IBC beyond just the Cosmos ecosystem. And um, like our team directly is working on that to make it easier for chains to develop other like client implementations. Um, and this work is, will be like complete um, at the end of next quarter. Um, but yeah, it'll be really exciting to see uh, which blockchain is going to be the first to actually plug into a Cosmos chain, which isn't uh, using the Tendermint like client. So um, yeah, I onboarding guess the, in that regard, I guess. Yeah, the ongoing ones being, you said, Substrate, Near, and the Zero Knowledge EVM clients. Yeah, so um, like something quite interesting, which I think has been like spoken about a lot on Twitter lately, is um, using IBC to form a direct connection to Ethereum. Um, so there were some teams who are using like a ZK Snark based light client um, to try and approach this problem because to date uh, basically the gas cost of updating a light client on Ethereum has just been way too expensive to make it like a reasonable thing to be doing right now. Um, but I think in the future we will see um, development going in that direction. Yeah, in terms of onboarding into the IBC um, ecosystem, that's what I'm sort of doing every day, trying to convince um, EVM projects to uh, to understand cross-chain because they've um, they've been forced to do this multi-chain but not cross-chain vision or like set up and when you talk to them about bridging they just think of token transfers and they don't think of the the sort of app chain model of uh, of things, so they still think they have to, you know, deploy in multiple places. Or, and I think what we're trying to do is create this this uh, state where IBC will inevitably come to all these ecosystems. But um, now that we have this, uh, Axlar has connected the ecosystems which don't have IBC yet we've just made the IBC sort of vision undeniable. They, they're a part of it whether they like it or not. So um, we can start building these, like, these cross-chain applications almost in um, first just onboarding users into the IBC world so they can uh, get assets into there and start like, get a couple of wallets, start using all the apps. Um, but then eventually we've got a lot of the infrastructure there ready for when IBC hits so we can start building like proper trustless applications. I'm curious, just as a follow-up, um, what are the metaphors that have been working the best for you, or how are you able to best describe, or like, what are things that people automatically pick up on when you're talking to these projects? Yeah, I think if you if you just imagine all the blockchains as one blockchain, like, so you should be able to just send a transaction, just call a smart contract anywhere, whether or not, you know, it's on your chain or not, um, and then you really have to step it up. Like people just don't, they don't understand. You can, you can say over and over and over, but then you show them the thing and you like talk them through it and they're like, oh, like, that's, yeah. And then I think, I think we've just got to do it one by one and yeah, that's the only way. Cool. Again, I think as someone from the Ethereum ecosystem, you're describing me and my crowd right now. We're like a year ago, we're like, what? Like, no. And I think recently there's been kind of like maybe a slight narrative shift for the Ethereum ecosystem from going from like this idea of one chain to rule them all to being like multi-chain to now being cross-chain. Um, so I love what you were saying about like how this is what you do every day and kind of like I think for the Ethereum people it's just now kind of getting on our radar the idea or the possibility that Ethereum could one day use IBC. Um, I don't have any specific direct experience obviously with onboarding anyone directly to IBC but I just thought it was like an interesting point that we're like on the opposite sides of this kind of like conversation um, and that there really is a shift going on in the Ethereum community that is like something that's very new to me and I think to a lot of people to have this mindset shift of like app chains are going to be a thing like this is the, the direction that we're heading in and that's why I'm here I'm like IBC I believe in it I fuck yeah. with IBC tough you know.
<laughs> and I guess like maybe as a Ethereum representative, maybe you could speak a little bit more to kind of, you mentioned something about the paradigm shift from moving from multi-chain to cross-chain. Maybe, um, you know, with obviously DYDX joining Cosmos and other kind of, you know, the, the latest AIP for cross-chain communication, maybe if you could talk a little bit about how this, how you see this paradigm shift more specifically in Ethereum. Yeah, so like right now in the Ethereum community, there's a few different teams working on protocols or, or projects even to say, solve a simple problem just like if I deploy an NFT on this chain I also want it on all these other chains because I have users and communities and when you think about users right like there's the developers who for us were like super married at least in the Ethereum because it's super married to our chain and we're like this is our chain but when you're thinking about users users have different things that they're optimizing for whether it be low cost fast transactions good user experience so now developers are stepping back and they're like okay I want my you know project to reach as many users as I can so now there's different teams that are like, okay, you can use this thing and deploy on Solana, deploy on Ethereum, deploy on Polkadot. So that's kind of what I mean when I say like I'm seeing that shift start to happen where we're looking for solutions where we're like, I want this to happen on multiple chains without necessarily having to rewrite my contract th this many times, do this many new deployments. So maybe as like a Cosmos convert, what would you say to these chains? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... Like, um, I love hearing, I, I honestly didn't know that there was work already in progress for non-Cosmos chains to be able to use IBC. So that's like really amazing to hear. And I think for Ethereum people, it's kind of hard. I mean, obviously for any ecosystem, maybe besides one like Cosmos, that's very multi-chain. It's hard for people to leave their ecosystem and go to a new L1 or go to a new ecosystem. So that is going to enable, I think, all the developers on Ethereum to imagine this new cross-chain future without necessarily having to like go through the trials and tribulations that a brand new team trying to develop this brand new protocol is going to go through that you guys have already gone through. Yeah, and second the UX thing, that actually really hits people. You, you can just all talk about UX and you talk about the, the addressable market as well because you know, if they can only service the people on their chain, suddenly they can service like, anyone with a crypto wallet. Um, and I think then the next thing will be if you make it as easy as possible for them to get into the IBC ecosystem, they'll try it and they'll see. Like I remember the first time he used Kepler and Osmosis, it was just like, oh my, like, this is, like, why is MetaMask not like this? But kind of thing. And I think it's mostly a business development problem than an engineering problem because it's also when when you talk to all these applications and you tell them like, oh, in our case, deploy to Evmos and it takes a lot of time and effort for these like um, applications to like migrate to a new chain and get their communities started and then man actively manage those organizations those um, those communities so I think like the main thing that we're looking for in the future is transitioning from a multi-chain ecosystem where like you're deploying multiple times to just having a single deployment on the interchain, uh, whatever that chain might be, and then connecting to every single chain that is out there through IBC and other interoperability solutions. So that's what we are trying to pitch to all these like decentralized applications on the Ethereum side. Um, and the access to liquidity, the access to like a new user base is one of the main selling points so far. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe just a plug for a workshop that didn't make it onto the agenda here. If you want to learn more about how to create these types of IBC complex workflows with token transfers and interchain accounts, I will be giving a workshop on this along with my colleague at Interchain, Aditya Shripal. Um, he's the IBC protocol architect and will explain to you how to do these things um, and present a live code demo of it. So just a plug. Um, that's, oh, that's tomorrow at 4 in the... Agoric. It's the Santander room. Yeah, in the Agoric workshop room. Okay. Uh, yeah, moving on to more content. So, yeah, for the last 10 minutes, um, obviously, I want to talk a little bit about the elephant in the room when it comes to, um, you know, the IBC ecosystem, but obviously the Cosmos ecosystem. Last year was a year of a lot of bridge hacks. Um, you know, it's been, it's been wild, frankly. Um, we had a huge ecosystem collapse, which was an IBC connected chain and obviously affected um, IBC transaction flow. Um, and so I just wanted to ask the panelists kind of, you know, what are, what are your takes on the security of the interchain ecosystem? How do you think IBC preserves this? How do you think this can be handled in the upcoming uh, future as more and more chains are added into this uh, ecosystem? Yeah, um, from a 
protocol point of view, IVC is very secure because it's, it relies on the security of the counterparty chain, um, running two light clients and verifying the proofs of the transactions um, to actually execute them. And it's not run by a set of uh, multisig keys as opposed to many EVM bridges. Um, here, the, in terms of security, where there might be some security considerations is at the application level, which are the specific business use cases that you built on top of the IVC core protocol, uh, which are specific to, ma to a particular chain, but also, for example, like IVC transfer is one particular um, IVC app that is shared across, like, at this point, all the chains that use IVC. So it's there where in my, there might be some like security considerations that might affect other chains, but r until now hasn't been the case uh, that we've had an exploit on, on IVC. Yeah, well, I think like as Benny mentioned, like the design of IVC is such that if there was to be an attack anyway, um, it would be isolated just to those chains. Like it wouldn't spread to the entire interchain ecosystem, um, which is uh, just due to the design choices there, which is really important for security. But um, given, <laughs> given that, um, I mean, this happened, you can't ignore that. I think um, it's important to just like realize how people responded to that. And um, so for instance, Osmos has developed a rate limiting middleware for IBC which is um, to prevent um, an excessive amount of liquidity leaving their chain in like a single transaction or within a certain time period. Um, so having things like this to kind of even strengthen the security of IBC further is gonna be really important in creating a resilient interchain. Um, but yeah, obviously the terror incident happened and I guess the main concern was when um, there was more liquidity on chains um, than the amount of liquidity that's actually securing the chain itself. Um, and I think this was like, not like a typical incident to happen. Um, but yeah, people haven't ignored it and have taken it seriously and are doing things about that. Yeah, IBC is um, it's a trustless protocol, but it's the infrastructure layer and we need yeah, like rate limiting application layer, almost like overlay protocols to um, to keep everything secure. I mean, our app is built so that, um, you know, all well, our contracts are stateless, so that we never hold any funds. The, there's only funds at risk while in transfer. So, and we swap into a native asset on the other side. And um, so, our, yeah, from the, from the beginning, yeah, if a bridge was hacked, the only people who've used our protocol in the past won't be uh, exposed to anything, to losing money. I think also we've seen uh, people, a lot of projects scrambling for, for this sort of position of being the uh, cross-chain protocol, um, and there's been a lot of compromise in design and, and like trying to work faster than they should. So I'm hoping things will get better, um, and maybe we'll settle on something. Maybe IBC will eventually um, be linking everything up, and we shouldn't have to worry about like five of nine multi-six getting hacked or. Um, but still, yeah, if IBC is, is everywhere, there'll still be more, more work for all of us to do to keep things secure. Yeah. I don't think I have enough domain expertise to speak on this, but I would love if it's okay with you to ask a question to them as, you know, what would you say, like simply, how would you explain kind of the trust assumptions that come with using IBC to someone who's not really in the Cosmos ecosystem compared to maybe like a traditional bridge or other bridge solutions that exist out there? Right, so um, in terms of IVC, you have two chains that want to connect to each other. And, and first, you create a light client for each of the chains. This is like mostly in the hands of the relayer that operates these two light clients that are afterwards used to verify transactions on each counterparty chain. You create these client states of the counterparty chain on each of the chains. And then you create a connection, and on top of that, you create the channels which are used for the specific applications on, built on IBC. So um, every time you send a transaction, you verify on the client state that you have on state from, from the other chain, um, if the transaction has been, um, you verify the miracle proofs. Yeah, you can um, kind of think about it like, um, 
each counterparty chain, like let's say I'm connecting to you, you have a photo of me and all the transactions that I've processed over the entire, as well as the root hash. And so you kind of know, okay, this latest transaction is part of this photo, and I also have the root hash that basically allows you to prove this transaction up to the final state of the chain. And I have that photo of you as well. And so this client state that Fede is talking about, which is, which is continuously updated by the relayer, is kind of like the source of, proof, uh, source of truth that you know for a fact that if I've sent you these tokens, I've actually locked up the tokens in my bank module because you can see it in the photo that you have of me. I would add um, that you can think of IBC security like it's the, the security is the same as the, cha the two chains that are connected. So you're relying on if there's no extra assumptions. Like if one of the chains had, I mean, it wouldn't. If the validators got compromised, then you know you're still going to lose your funds. But there's no extra like um, security risk. There's some censorship risk, but it's very low, and um, no one's going to lose money from censorship, I guess. Yeah, and on top of that, you can also close the channel if there's a vulnerability or something like that, so that you can like stop relaying transfers, for example, if you close the channel for the other chain that has suffered a vulnerability. So that's in addition to the security assumptions that uh, we just talked about. Thank you guys for answering that. Um, cool, yeah, and for the last few minutes, I guess um, if there's any concluding remarks from any of you guys on maybe the upcoming roadmap that you see. Yeah, I think um, we're gonna start expanding, so, I guess where we are now is like uh, a point of the interchain history of, or timeline where we have the IVC core protocol that allows us to build like new applications and then we have like a few applications in particular that are shared across most of the chains. Those are um, IVC transfers and uh, right now like ICA is being like pushed to be like one of the main ones, uh, interchain account accounts. Yeah. Um, and in the future, I think in the next year, we're gonna start seeing new applications, brand new applications on IVC, like for example, um, interchain queries, interchain workflows, um, and of course interchain security that are gonna create the next generation of chains. So I, I can imagine, for example, next year's Cosmoverse, how many new chains will be here that will be enabled by all these new applications that are going to be built because of these new set of applications uh, that IVC is going to be providing to the ecosystem. And I'm really excited about that and I think it's, we're going to fill two of these rooms um, with the amount of projects that are going to be building on IVC. Yeah, um, I think like there's exciting times ahead. Like, uh, Generally, as well, like interchain security uh, being underpinned by IBC, and I guess like the first instance is just the like one directional. But I think the mesh security is essentially like two directional uh, interchain security, um, which I mean I think that's really exciting for the future. And yeah, as I kind of mentioned, just generally allowing more complicated workflows to happen in the interchain. Um, like transfer plus um, cross-chain queries combined with interchain accounts. Like, I think there's quite a big open design space to be explored um, by different protocols and chains. Um, so yeah, I think in a year's time, as Benny mentioned, it'll be quite exciting to see what's born from this. Yeah, I agree with both of those. Super excited for uh, interchain accounts, just what we can build on that. Same. <laughs> Cool. Um, I guess that about wraps it up. Then thank you guys all for listening. And yeah. thank you very much. And don't forget the workshop tomorrow, <laughs> 4 p.m. Santander room. Amazing. Thank you.